Chris said, hey, listen, you know, I, I told him I'd send him the photos to email him. And he said, if you ever want to come up to Lemoore and take a tour, just let me know, email me. And again, it was one of those things that I just said, cool, thank you. Put away in my head and was like, I don't even know where Lemoore was. Like I said, I looked it up on a map. I saw it was in near, up near Fresno. And I don't know how many, you know, it, was probably, it wasn't right away. It was months later, six months later. I don't know. I emailed him and I said, you know what? I do want to come up. And yeah, I went up and he was flying for VFA 147 at the time. They fly F-35s now. And, you know, he was a lieutenant, young guy. And he gave me the, the dime tour, got some patches, got, some, got the t-shirt, stayed for the day. And he and I had talked, you know, and he had said, like, you know, what do you want to do? What are you doing? You know, what is this all about? And I kind of told him this story. And so, again, to preface that, that this was pre-Edwards. This was a, a year before Edwards. So, like, he, you know, I had flown and da-da-da. And I said, look, I would love to fly in a Navy F-18 sometime. And he's like, oh, you know, it's difficult. But you know what? Let me introduce you to our squadron commander because he has some background with this stuff. And he walked me into the CEO's office at the time. Um, and I sat with this man. And uh, like I said, probably one of my closest friends to this day now. And his XO is probably my best friend, um, which is a funny. It's in my book at the end. There's a little note about him. But anyway, <laughs> so Sista was, looked at me and he's like, like, tell me your story, blah, 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 blah. And it turns out that he had helped early in his career in the Navy, Eric Hildebrandt work on a couple projects so he understood the the wickets that needed to be pulled because it's all through public affairs uh i'm not going to get into the technicalities of the public affairs field but like it's it's a pain it's very difficult and in a sense they are the gatekeepers to everything even if it's coming from this end like the operations side they still have and rightfully so the input so yeah. but he had done this and at that time eric had stopped doing his books, his magazines, his freelance company that he had, which was Vultures Row. And he had gotten a job in flight test in for the Navy as a contractor. Um, I think he was a contractor at that time, but like, so he had kind of moved on. And it's funny because Eric and I ended up having dinner a bit after that and had a long talk about where the industry was and blah, blah. And he kind of was like, I'm out, I'm getting a full-time job. If you want to chase after this, it's yours, man. So Sista, had experience with this. And he said to me, I feel, and again, this is pre Maverick. Maverick wasn't even on a, on the radar and there's no discussion. The Navy had for a long time, Naval aviation at least had still been resting on top gun as sort of a driver for PR recruiting. You know, they had other things too. They have the blue angels air shows. There's other factors, obviously that are way above my pay grade, but like, the, the community itself, the naval aviation community, the pilots and the Wizzos and those folks kind of felt like we're not really telling our story, you know, um, because Top Gun is a movie and it's it's a comic book. You know, it's not accurate. <laughs> and he was in that he had that head. It was like, hey, we've we had a guy. He's no longer doing this, Eric. Um, we don't have a lot of narrative getting out there. And then that whole thing that I said about not about this is a super hornet. Here's all the nuts and bolts. It was like, Hey, what's, what's it like to be yeah. in the Navy? What's it like to be in Naval aviation? So he looked at me and said, if you want this, I will help you. We'll see what happens. He used to always joke with me. You know, he used to say like, I don't ever think you're going to get to fly in an F-18 until your ass is in the seat and you're literally rolling down the runway. Cause somebody's going to say no to this, but he, to his credit. And I mean, it's funny because my wife and my parents have never met him. But like, I feel like they have because I talk about Sista all the time. And like I said, he's been retired now for years. One of the most analytical, smartest people I've ever met in my life. And he's always three steps ahead of everybody else. He doesn't look like it when he's talking to you, but he is. So he had a plan in mind. And he said, look, it's not going to happen tomorrow. What I need you to do is I need you to formulate a plan to cover my squadron. We're in the middle of a workup cycle to go deploy in a year. So if you want to come back out here and spend time, take photos, write an article, do what you do, we need to start pushing that out to the public affairs folks to show that you're not only dedicated to this, to telling our story, but that you're putting the time in and, and doing good work. And so I did that. And I basically went, again, working for Air National at the time, um, 
Mark and I had discussions about we're covering VFA 147's workup. What does a squadron do to get ready to deploy in the Navy? The back of my mind, it was always like, okay, maybe I'll get a Rhino flight, you know, in the two seat because they're single seat squadrons. So there was no way that was going to happen, but they'd have to figure it out with another squadron. Um, we did that for a while. So I, I went to Lemoore a couple times. Um, I went to Fallon when they were doing their workups a couple times. Uh, and then Sista invited me to come out on the Nimitz a couple times. I think it was twice um, to watch what they do out there during workups with the whole air wing. That blossomed into me working with Mark to say, this is a whole piece on the air wing, really. VFA-147 is the crux of it. And their sister squadron, VFA-154, the Black Knights, which is the two-seat squadron in the air wing, it's kind of the crux of it. I'm not going to the places where like the helicopters were or the, you know, the growlers at the time, the, the EF-18s are up in Washington. I focused on the F-18, the Super Hornet squadrons at Lemoore, but I was telling the story of the whole air wing workup to go out on the Nimitz. So Mark, again, turned that into a multi-part series. And he guaranteed, he said, I'm going to have three 15-ish page, that's this, one of them, three magazines back to back to back, which we had only ever done one other time with Scott, which is this Afghanistan piece. Um, and I want to do like Lamore, Fallon, and the boat. Those are the three pieces of this story. And we're going to do them back to you know, trip back to back to back consecutive months in the magazine, which he had never really done. The, so the C-17 piece, by the way, became like a supplemental feature in the magazine. So it was like a standalone little pullout C-17. Um, it wasn't an article. So he made that like a special feature. This was actually a three-part series within Air International. So that like cover right there was one of them. Uh, that was when I flew, obviously. So it took a year. It was a year of me showing up, doing the work, getting to know, I mean, Look, again, as I'll say, the relationships I built, when I went to Lemoore, um, I was staying with the pilots in their house because after three or four times and they got hanging out with me, they were just like, you know, and again, one of them's a cyclist. We became close because of that. He just like, dude, just crash at my house. I mean, yeah. what are you doing? Don't stay. I, I think I stayed in a hotel once. Yeah. Um, so we literally kept going and he kept asking the question, how do I get Scott in the back of a jet? And everybody was like, no. No, they usually give it to sailors like who earned it. Like an, it's called an incentive flight, basically. Sailor of the year. Um, the Blue Angels kind of handle the publicity part where it's like an actor, a NASCAR driver, a hero, like a teacher, which is that's what their thing is. Flying in a fleet aircraft. Eric was one of the few people I had known that had done that a lot. Um, Ted Carlson had done it as well. Uh, Rick Lalarnis, a few others, Fuji Ramos. But like a fleet Super Hornet, I hadn't seen in a long time. Eric did a book called Fly Navy, which was the hundred years, you know, hundred years of naval aviation. He flew like in one of every platform, which was unheard of. But that it's a big, thick book, coffee table book, amazing book. I'm gonna toot Eric's horn and say, go buy it. It's still available. It's the centennial <laughs> of naval aviation. He covered every platform that the Navy flies, and he flew in all of them. So that was kind of like Ernie had helped him with that, and Sista, as call sign, and um, so he kind of knew. And so the at the end, I'll never forget this. I was in at Fallon on one of my trips. Um, the XO, the story I'll tell you really quickly about the XO. The XO of the squadron at the time, he was a, a demo pilot. So the Navy has a Super Hornet demonstration team that goes to the air shows. The Blue Angels do their thing. The Super Hornet demo team is the single ship at the air show when they fly an F-18 for a demo. Um, he was one of those guys. So he knew he had met going to all these air shows for like two years, like a lot of photographers, a lot of aviation photographers. While he loved and appreciated the work that they did, he kind of, he was like, okay, I've been around photographers a ton. Who is this guy? Like, why is he lurking in our squadron all the time? Like, yeah. what's going on? So he was a little like, I, I joke with him all the time. Cause like, now we're like talk like every day. I'm like, you hated me when I walked in the door. <laughs> like whenever I'd show up, he'd be like, why is Scott here again? Well, I, I don't <laughs> trust these photographer guys and he's writing an article. And what's his, everybody thought I was going to say something bad. You know, I'm not that person. So my thing with the Navy that I guarantee or any of the military or law enforcement have you seen is like, I'm not there to stir the pot. I'm there to promote in the, in a positive light. I'm not there to sugarcoat it either. If you told me that there's something wrong and you want it out there, I'll say it. But I'm not like um, the guy in the news that's like trying to stir the pot. To Looking for dirt, yeah. Right? So he was always skeptical of me until later on. But at the very end, I went. I drove back up to Fallon, which is like nine and a half hours from here. 
and he um the sista had been asking and asking and asking over again about me getting in the back of one of vfa 154's jets and they kept saying no uh you know probably about 40 people involved in these emails and then i was sitting in the o club with the cag which is the air group commander um the air group commander was also a former blue angel so he was insane the same mindset as sista was about publicity he got it and he, he had seen me lurking around for like a year so we're sitting in the o club at like nine o'clock on a you know whatever night it was friday and he's sitting next to me at the bar and he said so scott how was your your rhino flight what'd you think and I get, I went, sir, I never flew in the Rhino. He goes, what are you talking about? I've seen so many emails. I signed off on that months ago. I said, well, it's kind of hung up here and there. And he goes, no, no, that, that, no. <laughs> and all I know is like the next week I went back to LA and they insist to call me. He's like, okay, you're going to go fly in a Rhino now. So something happened, right? It was just a funny story because apparently he just called and said, why is this not happen? And I'm a cat. Yeah. I, I don't think he'd do anything weird. It was just, it happened all of a sudden. So when I flew with them, you know, we did, we finished this three-part series. And then very shortly after is when I got the job at Edwards. When I left Edwards and started um, Mach 91, Sista was wherever he was in his career, uh, going through, you know, the, the, the stuff that he got promoted into and eventually came back to Lemoore. He was in the Pentagon for a while. He was at, uh, at one of the highest level um, schools in the Navy for foreign policy. He also was a test pilot school graduate. So I mean, like pretty heady guy. Um, he was back at Lemoore and he was assigned to VFA 122, which is the training squadron. So obviously we were friends at that point. And he's like, what do you want to do now? Like, what should we do now? Kind of thing. It was just very casual. And I'm like, well, let's do an article on what it takes to train a super Hornet pilot. Like, let's do something like that. Cool. Let's do it. And obviously not that it's any easier, but the fact that 122 is basically has an abundance more of, I mean, they have anywhere, you know, sometimes 40 super Hornets where a normal squadron has 12 or 15, a fleet squadron. They're the largest squadron in the Navy, a lot of two seats. So it was a little bit more um, in his, in his mind, I think able to, to get me in there without interfering with anything like training, you know, if there's an empty back seat, some, some of the guys that are going to go off to fly single seaters, you know, you can fly a two seat F-18 Super Hornet in the front seat. You don't need someone in the back necessarily yeah. just for training, you know, um, but they also have training with those in their pipeline. So they they do go in the back seats a lot, but there's availability there. So that, again, turned into a conversation where, you know, I'm going to turn it into a magazine article. We're going to make it a bigger magazine article. And Mark and I had talked about that a little bit. And as we started just running through the various things that we were talking about, it was like, this isn't really a magazine article anymore. And I was going back and looking on my bookshelf. And like when I was a kid, the books I stuck in the box and storage, there were two or three books that were written back in the 90s about earning your wings. You know, one's called Wings of Gold. There's another one, that, there are two or three. Um, so there was a background in telling that story as far as getting to become a Navy pilot or maybe an Air Force pilot. I think most of them were Navy books. Um, nobody had ever done like what happens after. Like, so you get your wings, right? You, you get, you get your commission as an officer, you get approved, you know, accepted into flight school, you go through flight school, you select, or the Navy selects, depending on the time you put your wish list down. And depending on the needs of the Navy, you, if you're good in your class, you can select fighters. Then you go to the fleet replacement squadron for let's say super Hornets, which one is in Lemoore and one's in Oceana. There's two. Um, so that story had never really been told. So it's kind of the gap between you're in the fleet as a full-blown Super Hornet pilot or the kid that just got his wings and is approved to go into the strike fighter community. And he's right now, today, he's either going to go F-35, Super Hornet, or EF-18, Growlers. That's that's the pipeline. So, you know, it's always been that, like, that's the top of the tip of the spear, uh, you know, best of the best, whatever you want to call it. I've learned now that that's accurate, but not always accurate. I mean, there are amazing H-60 pilots in the Navy. There are amazing P-8 pilots. They're all amazing, right? So fighter community is one. There's others. Um, I guess if you ask a fighter pilot, they're going to say there aren't. But you know, like, <laughs> I, I learned from being around, I respect all of them equally. Um, the, the thing with the fighter pilots is the guys and the E-2 pilots as well, um, they land on the boat. That separates yeah. them from some of the others. The helicopter guys do. But So as we were formulating that plan, 
and we realized this is a much bigger story to tell. I had no idea about book. I mean, I had seen all these books, just like in the past, I had seen all the magazine articles. I had seen Eric's books and all the other guys that I looked up to. I didn't have any idea. So I just started pitching the idea to various, you know, pull the bookshelf. Book, I took the book off the bookshelf, found out the editor emailed, and I said, this is the story I'm telling. No, we're not interested. That's too, too myopic. It's a single squatter and you're telling one story, blah, 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 whatever. So I just kept working and I figured I'd figure it out somehow or another. And um, it was at that same time that we were kind of formulating the plan that Sista had said, look, the only way you're going to be able to tell the story is if you fly, like you can't fly once. And the Navy, the way their structure is, is an incentive flight is one and done. So the fact that I flew in a Rhino in, in 2015-ish, that was it. That's it. You don't go back. It's kind of like a, you know, like whatever the reasons are for putting someone in the back as an incentive flyer, it's to show them the Navy, Naval Aviation, whatever the reasons you've seen it. Don't ask again. Yeah. He was like, we're not going to be able to do this. And the only way to do that, he said, is to actually train you. Like you already have the training from Edwards. So I'm going to use that in a sense to, to tell the powers that be down in San Diego. Like this isn't just like a guy that we're just going to throw back there a bunch of times. Like he's, he knows the safety, he knows the survival we can expand on that, but it's not going to come without, you know, the knowledge that he's not like just some guy off the street. I trust this. So it took a while again, and then they, they kept saying no, um, but they agreed that, you know, I had to go through Navy water survival. I had to go through, you know, various courses um, and they, they approved it. And what they did is they gave me, it's, it's, a, it's kind of, again, it's like in Navy flight test, there's flight test engineers. They're called project specialists they're trained to fly in the backseat of whatever aircraft. Like, like I said, Eric Hildebrandt is a flight test photographer at Pax River, which is the Navy's flight test base on the East Coast for all their aircraft. It's there, Edwards. And he flies all the time. And he's this, you know, government employee now that does the training. Project specialist is kind of a, it's at like a no man's land. It's a very hard thing to figure out, but it's in there. It's in their manuals. So that's what he did is he basically said, we're going to do this. And we're going to see if we can run it through. And, you know, eventually I took all the training. I did what I needed to do. And he gave the Navy an outline of like what flights I was going to do for what reasons, you know, and a timeline, which slipped a lot for their, for various reasons. Like just nothing was ever the day of. Yeah. And that's, that's how the book came about was like, I, I just started sh doing the work, putting everything together to n give, to create a narrative that was much longer than I initially anticipated. And then at the same time, sort, sort of figure out how am I going to publish this thing? And it, I, I ended up going with a publisher that a friend of mine recommended. It's I was going to self-publish it because in this world nowadays with books, I mean, aviation is a very, you know, it's a, it's a small niche kind of topic. Not everybody's going to buy it at Barnes and Noble, nor would they even carry it. Um, although I just found out they are carrying my book, but online. So it's like, it's, but online is different, you know, um, there, there was a period of time where I just kept being told no. And then a friend of mine had published, which is my publisher's uh, company is called mascot. And they're, it's a publisher where you're basically sort of doing some of it more, more of it yourself or part of it yourself. And then they supplement, you know, so you're not like dealing with like uh, penguin books, like a big time. I'm not that guy, you know, I'm not, um, as you know, Matthew Perry just came out with his big you know, autobiography. I'm not Matthew Perry. Nobody's going to just say, here's a million dollars, go publish this book. Here's a, yeah. here's a, you know. so I, I kind of, I worked around the publishing system and found the best option for me. And I mean, the, it, it was the right way to do it. So that's how that kind of came about. It was just through, again, being in this place, having his idea, my idea, we melded our, our ideas together, kind of, you know, spent a year to a year and a half being told no every time by somebody, you know, again, it's not an exaggeration. When I would get emails that he would send off to whomever, you know, whether it was a, somebody at the fleet, you know, Naval Air Forces in San Diego, there's an air boss, he's a three-star. This was all the way up at his level, this kind of approval to get this kind of me in this type of, you know, situation. He, and he was a fan. I had met him many times. He was aware of me. He was, he was a fan of what I was trying to accomplish. So he was cool with it. Then it trickles down to their safety people, their operations people, their public affairs people. And I would 
get emails where there would be like 60 CCs on them. I mean, no exaggeration, you know, and you would just see this conversation and, and then one person would say, well, I have an issue, you know, I'm not sure about, and he'd be like, we're, we're on pause again. But those, those pauses would be like two months sometimes. Yeah. It's so it was painful. I mean, it wasn't, it was, I, you know, there are many times I thought this ain't happening. It's, it's How many years happening. total did it take to, to work, to make the book what it is? Five. 